reputation of the fighter pilot, and particularly the Top Gun graduate, is that he's a risk taker. And you really are looking for that guy. The problem is, in peacetime, he's usually out of place. He usually tears up the bar, chases the commanding officer's daughter. He's that, he usually is that kind of a guy, and Top Gun hopefully tries to balance that. They make them intelligent about their recklessness, if you can say such a thing. Five two zero sending commands from A side. Five zero command control five five. Two zero two top gun ball nine two couple. So you're forty six needles. I'm slightly right at the three quarter mile. Watch the ball couple. Sag. Half low. One or two guys makes mistakes down there, and they get killed or they kill somebody else. A lot of people say that, well, it's very dangerous, but it is on a flight deck. There's jet blast all over you. It's noisy. You don't know what the hell's going on. People are grabbing you. Don't step across this line. When we're involved in launch and recovery aboard the ship, it really is a fine-tuned, finely choreographed ballet, almost, if you will. When I'm taxiing my jet around the flight deck, I'm not just going where I want to go. I'm always under the direction of one of these taxi directors. If I take my eyes off of him for an instant, uh, the chance is that if I'm on my own program, I could run into something up there, another jet, a piece of equipment, uh, one of the air crew. Underneath, by the nose gear, is a guy on his knees, essentially, moving across. And he is checking that the whole back is in position and that when they put you in tension, Tension is when they cock the gun, essentially. The shuttle moves forward and the launch bar is sitting in the shuttle. So he'll run out from under the airplane and he'll give you a thumbs up. Right prior to that happening, the guy in the yellow shirt will give you a signal like this, and that's your cue and the pilot to go to full power as far as military power. We go to military power, all the control surfaces on the airplane move. External to the airplane are troubleshooters, and they'll give a thumbs up. They're looking at all the control surfaces and make sure they all move. This is the last chance to save an airplane from going flying. It isn't ready to go flying. The pilot's going through looking for uh, indications in his cockpit that everything's OK. Once he's satisfied this airplane's ready to go flying, he'll salute. That guy will salute you back. And he touches his deck. The guy pushes a button, and you're off to the race. The cat launch is often called the second most dangerous routine in aviation, a routine performed daily by some of the world's hottest young pilots. They are, by any standard, an elite group. Their primary mission, to defend the fleet, and if needed, give their lives to protect their mothership, the carrier. <laughs> in recent years, United States Navy pilots have engaged in over 1,000 intercepts above the Mediterranean alone. Intercepts in which potentially hostile aircraft have been shepherded away from U.S. carrier task forces. Launching from the ship or taking off from the ship with the catapult launch is, is really a rush. You know, there's a real man's airplane. It's uh, pretty much uncontrollable. It's one of the few things. Some pilots really don't care for it because they don't have any control over it. Pilots like to be in control, that type A personality. And uh, I, I personally think it's sort of a rush. I, I enjoy it. I don't think there's ever been a catapult shot where I haven't been yelling down the catch stroke because it's, it's just a really forceful feeling. Once a guy pushes a button, you're long for a ride. And that's two and a half seconds that you are completely out of the loop, which you'll go from zero to 150 miles an hour. You don't have a lot of time to make decisions right there. And if something catastrophic, you are 60 feet above the water. And your time to make a decision whether or not you can handle this emergency, and then the time it takes to reach down and pull the handle to eject. Some guys actually, in the past, had an emergency, 
recognize it, try to pull the handle, but because it's so quick, they end up killing themselves because they went to the water. If the second most dangerous routine in aviation is launching a carrier jet, the most dangerous by far is bringing one back aboard. My first carrier landing, I was uh, completely terrified. Uh, I, uh, I was scared, sweating, I think I had tunnel vision, but I got it on deck thanks to the guys who had trained me <laughs> and uh, led me by the hand, and uh, it got better after that. As I was coming down to land, my primary instruments uh, went away and my heads-up display went out. We don't practice a whole lot of those uh, in the Hornet community. I can only remember that uh, the deck was, at one second, was a square, and the next second it was uh, basically a flat line. It was pitching that bed. Throughout their careers, pilots are graded on each and every landing. Their target, a 40-foot stretch of flight deck, dissected by four cables. A perfect landing means hitting cable number three. But slamming into the deck at 150 knots makes this problematic at best. For this young pilot, landing in a severe crosswind leads to a fatal miscalculation. Check your lineup. Hold it up. Power. Power. Check your lineup. Hold it up. Power. 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 on the carrier, it's actually a lot easier than it looks during the day in really good circumstances, really good conditions. Don't tell the Air Force that because then they'll want to do it. You can take day traps and uh, give me a thousand of them today and I'll do them because they're that much fun. Night traps, a little bit different. Landing on the carrier at night is sort of a different story. Uh, you never get used to it and it's always at least just a little bit scary. It, it's dark. It's, it's very dark, and uh, I don't think you really know what dark truly is until you put yourself a few hundred miles off the coast out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, that only point of light is that one light dancing around in front of you, and that's the ship bobbing up and down on the waves. Your visual cues are, are taken away, and you're out there at three miles, and it's like a little floating, floating uh, postage stamp down there that's barely lit up, and uh, it's a little bit harder to try to detect changes that, uh, that could prove hazardous if uh, you don't take care of them in a timely manner. I still, to this day, uh, find my adrenaline pumping so much that at, at night, I'll find my left leg uh, shaking from the adrenaline after the trap. Night trap horror stories are legendary. Yet the Navy never runs out of eager young men who long to become a part of that legend. I think if a junior aviator knew what night traps were like, uh, knew how scared he should be, they wouldn't do it. They'd, we'd run out of pilots. Just staying focused on lineup, flying the ball, and uh, keeping the jet on speed. And that's really all you have time to think about. There are a lot of other scary things that come to mind, but you have to push them out of the way and, and get the job done. Otherwise, you don't get dinner. Confidence in flying the plane is nothing more than no matter what might occur, I can hack it. And I mean no matter what, I can hack it. And there's nothing dramatic or so subtle or sophisticated here that's involved with that. It's just a basic belief in your heart that you know what you have to do and you're confident in your ability to do it. You can hack it when it gets rough like that. There's no gunfighter approach to that or anything or arrogant approach. It's just a, a belief internal to you that you can hack it when the going is the toughest and it means the most. I heard someone say once that, oh, you're a fighter pilot, you must have really quick reflexes or good instincts. And I don't think that's necessarily true. If you're reacting to what's happening in the jet, then you're probably behind. You need to be thinking ahead. So being able to visualize beforehand what's going to happen, 
to think about it, to be prepared, is the most important thing. A nice day for flying. Oh yeah, you know it. Nothing better epitomizes America's devotion to military preparedness than the Navy Fighter Weapons School at Miramar. Most call it Top Gun. Each year, less than 40 aviators are chosen to go through the eight-week course. When finished, they will stand at the center of the bullseye, the elite of one of the most competitive professions known to man. When I was selected for Top Gun, it was a tremendous rush. I never thought that I would get chosen for it, to be honest. Uh, I guess I thought I was in the running, but there were a lot of great guys in my squadron that could have gone. And the thing that I, I really thought about most was that I had to come out here and do well and take back as much knowledge as I could because the other guys in the squadron are counting on me to do that. Right here is Miramar, and what we'll do is we'll fly out over the range, fly the hop, and this is uh, also where we have a tax range or an ACMI range, like that scene in Top Gun where you saw, you know what a tax range is, sure. And we'll just go back and we'll replay the entire flight and we'll use it for, as a training aid. Unlike the frat boy image portrayed by the Hollywood film, Top Gun students are all seasoned veterans. The average 30 years of age and most have well over 500 hours in the jet that they fly. They are the inner circle, and like all Navy flyers, each proudly bear a call sign given to them early in their career. For better or worse, it will stick with them until retirement. My call sign is Gucci. Some friends of mine in the squadron uh, said I had a Gucci car, Gucci girlfriend, Gucci watch, wore Gucci sunglasses, and it just stuck. I got my call sign scorch in the training command early on. I, uh... I tried to stop the airplane a little too quickly, and uh, the brakes got hot and hot enough to catch on fire, and uh, it was a little embarrassing, to tell you the truth, but uh, I'm Scorch. My call sign is Rain Man, and the reason I got that, I guess, is I tend to go off on random subjects or tell stories that have a lot to do with nothing in the ready room, so the guys were pretty quick to jump on that. Names like Puke and Ratbreath may seem less dignified than Red Baron, but today's young pilots are consummate professionals. Professionals who bear the very traits that made men like von Richthofen such formidable warriors. The pilots have eyes like hawks. They've all got great eyesight. It's a gift from the Lord. Just like speed is to the athlete, eyesight is to the, to the fighter pilot. And I'm not talking 2020. I'm talking more like 2010. They've got that aggressive spirit, and they've got this absolutely uh, bonfire intense desire to become the best that they can possibly be. He's also someone that, that loves flying his plane. He doesn't get in the plane, he straps the plane on his back, and he likes flying at one inch out of control all the time, but in a purposeful way, looking for these opportunities to shoot down the enemy. Von Richthofen often claimed that four-fifths of his victims never knew he was there. They simply did not see him. And for this, they died. Eyesight has always been critical to survival in a dogfight. It still is. Modern radar can be rendered useless. Often, young pilots simply have it looking in the wrong piece of sky. Today's fighter jets can close on one another at speeds as fast as 3,000 miles an hour. Those with keen eyes can spot bandits from 15 miles away. If they don't, this leaves less than 10 seconds before the enemy has them cold. Time 4-3. Morning and welcome to TAC 4.3. We've got the time. Miramar is far more than a dogfighting school. It is an aerial laboratory where new technologies and tactics are constantly put to test. Here, pilots master the nuances of both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground strikes. The men of Top Gun are not only superb aviators, they must also possess patience 
and the kind of presence that naturally commands the respect of their peers. Once finished, Top Gun graduates serve as a teaching cadre, disciples who take their newfound knowledge and the latest tactics back to the fleet. Similarly by the F-14 and the F-5. And then wrapping it all up today, putting the teacher hat on. It's about instructing. It's about training. It's about teaching the teacher that's going to go back out into the fleet and relay the knowledge that he's gotten here to the fleet aviator. Because it's the fleet aviator that's going to go out there in uh, whether it's Bosnia or Desert Storm or wherever the next conflict is, they're going to be the ones that are out there training the other pilots around them on the latest in weapons, weapon systems, tactics, and threat tactics. We're going to be doing uh, what's called a self-escort strike. We've got a target, we've got some bombs, and our job is to uh, fight our way into the target and then uh, drop the bombs on the target and fight our way back out. There'll probably be some bad guys there who are going to try to stop us, so uh, I think we'll make it, though. Rain Man and his classmates begin in one versus one duels. Over time, they engage in large-scale aerial dogfights, learning how to lead groups of aircraft into combat. In each engagement, they will do battle with Miramar's instructor pilots posing as the enemy. These are the bad guys right here, so we've got to be quiet. Can't let them know our plan. The bandits they face are actually F.A. 18 Hornets clad in aggressor colors. Some even sport the red star of the former Soviet Union, and they fly according to the known parameters of Eastern Bloc aircraft. The way we simulate different types of aircraft, be it the MiG-29 and MiG-21, is just by knowing how we expect that plane to be flown. We, we know the performance characteristics of, say, a MiG-21. And so we would, we would fly it like a MiG-21 using the throttle and stick. If the plane has a radar, then we will use our radar the way we, we would expect that radar to be used. If the MiG-21 can only pull a certain number of Gs, then we would pull those number of Gs. If it can go so fast, we would only go so fast. So that those are the ways that we simulate flying those aircraft. The target that Rain Man's flight must hit lies hundreds of miles from Miramar at a desert range in Nevada. Got the control building right there. Here we come. Solution Q's coming down. Boom, we're off. This is when class really begins. Seconds after unloading their bombs, the students are jumped by a trio of instructor bandits. Got to merge just south of the target. When you come in and emerge with airplanes flying as, as fast as they do, you're closing about a mile every three seconds. So 40 miles apart, that thing's over in about a minute. You're coming in there. You're scanning your radar. You've probably got wingmen out there. You're wondering how many guys he has. There's a lot of things going on. And when you finally do get to that merge, you're looking at your airspeed. You're trying to evaluate your energy state. You're looking at uh, the bandit's posture. Does he see you? Does he not see you? You're worried about whether he has other people that are trying to shoot you while you're shooting at that particular guy at the merge. And all at the same time, there's a lot of people talking on the radio. You're trying to keep track of your wingmen. So there's a lot of things going on through your mind that you try to have to prioritize. And uh, hopefully, you uh, put them in the right order. Okay. There's no threat to you now. There's no threat. Overhead, overhead. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I can't do anything about it. Eh? Okay, uh, 300 knots. Dogfighting is sheer physics. It is angles versus energy. The tighter the angle or turn, the greater the loss of energy or speed. In this three dimensional chess game, Pilots must constantly reconfigure these equations while twisting and turning at the speed of sound, under gravity forces up to nine times that of nature. Aerial combat is an exhausting chore. Flying the aircraft on its outer edge causes the pilot to experience intense Gs. Blacking out is a constant danger. Throughout the fight, he grunts and flexes his muscles to keep blood flowing to the brain. Okay, Tyler, watch past on my left side now. Right coming up on you. 
Turn around. Snap. Little look. Less than a minute after it begins, it is over. There's a gun on the F-14. If this were war, these Tomcat students would not be coming home. Okay, I'm home. They face men who have racked up more aerial combat hours than any aviators in the world. So I understand that was for you in the West. It is nearly unheard of for young apprentices to prevail in the skies over Miramar. Instructors spend three years at the school. Most can read a student's energy state to a whisker. Recommend terminate. Knock it off, knock it off. Fighters, knock it off. And it's knock it off. One of the keys of a good instructor is flying the plane just hard enough to teach, not as hard as you can fly it, because if you're just beating everybody on the block, beating them, beating them solid all day in and day out, it's difficult to generate the right type of learning environment. So one of the keys of a mature instructor is to be able to fly the plane just hard enough to teach. Never roll over, but fly that thing just hard enough to teach. A lot of bandits. We had a little, uh, little hassle coming off target. But that was pretty fun too. After every flight, when you come back and uh, the instructors who are the bad guys out there sort of kicked your butt, then uh, you have to reassess and uh, take home the lessons learned. Once you've gone through the debrief, though, you realize that even though you've made some mistakes, there are a lot of things that you're doing right as well. Put his nose on. So if that happens now, as you can see, if the MiG-29 goes nose high, the F-18 can do a couple of things here, depending on what his airspeed is. He could go ahead, and if he sees that overshoot, he might reverse at that point. And now, what we have, basically, is two aircraft pointed extremely nose high, trying to keep the other guy from, uh, from getting behind him. And basically, what we have now is a race to the wall, and the last guy there is going to win. Beating another man in the air means having absolute SA, or situational awareness. Knowing at all times how your aircraft is oriented to the ground and to the enemy plane. Survival in an aerial duel also requires intense aggression. This is far more than simple fighter jock bravado. In 1916, German ace Oswald Bolka, the father of air combat, issued a 10-point manifesto that is still followed today. Point number two states, if you initiate the attack, carry it through. Aggressiveness and determination are critical to survival. Somewhere in the range of 80% of the kills in combat occur off the first turn. If that's in fact the case, as it appears it is based on the studies that have been done, then it's absolutely critical to make that first turn a good one. And we don't ever tell our pilots to, um, shall we say, fly inappropriately to structurally damage the airplane, but, but just short of that, we encourage them to really turn hard and go for the throat immediately when you have an opportunity to put a weapon on someone. As we say, get the killing work over with quickly. Oh, what a beautiful shot. It is a deadly craft that has existed since the airplane first went to war. A craft that, due to advances in beyond visual range missiles, many now say is a thing of the past. Ever since World War I, the maneuvering dogfight has been in place. And ever since World War I, everybody tries to say it's over. After World War I, the common wisdom was, guys are gonna be going 200 miles an hour, it'll suck the, the wind out of their lungs and they won't be able to breathe. Not true. World War II comes along, we get totally surprised by the Japanese Zero and the Messerschmitt 109. And these guys, these Germans and Japanese, are maneuvering like mad. And we are back in the maneuvering fight again. So we build maneuverable airplanes uh, that will outmaneuver and outperform these airplanes. Great, fine. Well, World War II ends, and we come into the jet era. Oh, jets are here. You can't possibly turn a jet tight because it'll turn the guy in the cockpit into a puddle. So therefore, dogfighting is over. We won't do this anymore. And we build bomber interceptors. Well, Korea comes along. Go, we're maneuvering again. We're, 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 oh, no, we're, we're having to maneuver against these guys and still fire guns. 
The reason the airplanes were so good is a bomber interceptor requires a large wing, and as a result, you can turn tight with a large wing. This is the F-86. And so we go all the way through Korea doing the dogfight again. And fortunately, a lot of the World War II guys were there. They were 30 years old now, and they had been aces in World War II, so they were good. And the dogfighting skill was still there. Korea's over. We're now in the nuclear age. We're going to have a nuclear confrontation. We're going to be shooting down bombers. So we design interceptors without guns inside, because we are not going to be shooting down enemy fighters anymore. This is all going to be a beyond visual range, long range missile environment. By the late 50s, Air Force and Navy commanders were so smitten with long range missiles that mock dogfighting was actually forbidden. To gain experience, pilots would often rendezvous secretly at a prearranged altitude to engage in the illicit act. We build the F-4, the ultimate interceptor, no gun inside. We get to Vietnam, and all of a sudden, we're facing the same small maneuverable fighters. And this time, we don't have maneuverable fighters at all. The North Vietnamese rely primarily on the MiG-17. It is subsonic and 20 years older than the F-4. The supersonic American jet is considered state-of-the-art, but compared to the nimble Russian plane, it is huge, and its twin engines belch smoke that make it easy to spot. Making matters worse, Phantom crewmen have been taught to fight a nuclear war. It is a tragic combination. Soon, nearly half the engagements over Southeast Asia end with an American aircraft going down in flames. And unlike the single-seat MiG, Phantom pilots go down in twos. Hailed as the weapon of the future, the new long-range AIM-7 Sparrow misses nine out of 10 times. And when the longest range kills end up being two American F-105 Thunder Chiefs, visual identification is mandated. Our weapon systems were not up to speed. Our Phantom pilots were trained as interceptor pilots, but there was not going to be any more dogfights. You're only going to shoot bombers from Russia coming across at point nine Mach. And we were engaged with tight turning MiGs, and we weren't doing very well. The MiG-17 turned at about 19 degrees a second. A Phantom turned at about 11 degrees a second, which tells me if I get behind him and he turns at 19 degrees and I turn at 11 degrees, it doesn't take a mathematician very long to figure out he's going to come back around and shoot me if I try and stay in a horizontal fight. Now, that's not very good when you have, a, uh, in those days, a million-dollar MiG versus a $20 million Phantom. It doesn't take too much arithmetic to figure out what's wrong here. So. The Top Gun School was born out of that. As U.S. losses mount, military commanders look for an answer. By March 1969, the first Navy pilots are mixing it up in the skies above Miramar Naval Air Station. Here, 30,000 feet over Southern California, the American dogfighting tradition will be reborn. The reputation of the fighter pilot, and particularly the Top Gun graduate, is that he's a risk taker, that he's willing to, to hang out on the edge. And you really are looking for that guy. You're looking for the guy who has kind of got a balance between being safe when he needs to be, but really getting in there and doing the job if he has to, without worrying about his wife, without worrying about his kids, without worrying about his own safety. A fighter pilot has to be out on the edge when he flies. The problem is, in peacetime, he's usually out of place. He usually tears up the bar, wrecks his car, um, chases the commanding officer's daughter. He's that, he usually is that kind of a guy. In wartime, he's brilliant, just brilliant. He is in place. He's where he should be. It's, he's a warrior. I'm sure Randy would agree with this. There are some things... Pilot Randy Cunningham and his backseater, Willie Driscoll, are among the first Phantom crews sent to Miramar. I was a maverick. I believed that the only thing that mattered was killing and surviving in the air, and I dedicated myself to that. To me, dying was a pretty serious thing. 
times uh, have changed little since the time of Rick Tobin, uh, Oswald Boca, uh, Emmelman, oh, Galland. Happy and Boynton and Chuck Yeager and Wally Schirra, people that had set the stage for us. And I knew why they were successful, because they focused on the air. When I knew that I was going to meet another pilot in the air, that I wasn't going to walk away alive if I wasn't prepared. So some of the other things were secondary to me. And what I wanted to do is flight and fight, not only fight, but to complete my mission and come back from it. That was what was important to me. With A-4 Skyhawks posing as MiGs, Marine and Navy pilots rapidly sharpened their skills. By 1972, over 100 aviators have passed through the halls of Miramar. For most, the next stop is Vietnam. We fought against anything that would turn that was dissimilar to the Phantom. And when I met my first MiG, I had 200 simulated combats under my belt. I had far more experience than the MiG driver had. Top Gun had taught them to play to their strengths. For those flying the F-4, that means using the Phantom's speed and vertical acceleration to counter the MiG's tight turning ability. One solution rediscovered at Miramar is the classic high yo-yo, a maneuver in which the Phantom pilot, when finding himself turning with a MiG, uses his superior power to thrust into the vertical and loop back down for the kill. By early 1972, Top Gun graduates, Cunningham and Driscoll, make a name for themselves by flaming their first MiG and ending a two-year American drought. As of yet, the war has not yielded a single American fighter ace. On May 10, 1972, Duke Cunningham and Willie Driscoll set out from Yankee Station on what would become the most famous strike mission of the Vietnam War. They fly in as bombers that day, their target, a rail yard not far from downtown Hanoi. Hitting anything near the city means running through plenty of ground fire and braving an iron ring of Soviet-made surface-to-air missiles. B3, AAA at 10 o'clock. The Italian target them. The AAA blanket becomes increasingly intense. Cunningham and Driscoll decide on a steep bomb run to get them in and out as quickly as possible. They come off target unscathed and immediately encounter nearly 22 enemy fighters swarming down on the squadron. Left with no alternative, they must fight their way out or die. Cunningham's first AIM-9 Sidewinder kill is easy and quick. But seconds after flaming the MiG, Driscoll spots their wingman in serious trouble below. We looked down uh, below us on the left side. We saw our Navy F-4 that appeared to be in big trouble. He was in a gentle left turn with two enemy planes behind him at 1,000 feet, and a third looked like he was coming up to join on his wing. So we rolled on our back, and we were pulling hard down. And as we did, we would call an F-4 and a left turn, break left. And he still continued in his gentle turn. F-4 and a left turn, break left. You know, and the guy still continued in his gentle turn. He didn't see the one coming in to join on his wing. And then the third call by us was, God damn it, F-4, break left, you're going to die. In which case, all the F-4s out there broke left. In a near suicidal move, Cunningham and Driscoll dive down into the pack of MiGs on their wingman's tail, an act for which they are later nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor. I've passed an airplane head on, and I want to get over and help my wingman because he's got a MiG on his tail. I have to visually figure out, can he get back around? Can I get from this point 
and help my wingman before he can get back around and engage me. And in many cases, you're talking about milliseconds and half second times the difference between life and death. And if you don't train to that scenario, you're not gonna survive over the long period of time. When you're in the dogfight itself, it's, you, you try to feel cold and detached, but I mean, you're, you're trying very hard not to come literally unglued at the seams. I think all of the uh, emotions and feelings known to man, you're experiencing at some level. I've always likened it to the outer stratosphere of tension and anxiety and fear. Normally, when you're over enemy territory, you're able to jam the fear element back down. When you're getting shot at, you're able to jam the fear element back down. I mean, it's intense, and by that I mean you got the shakes and you're trying not to throw up. Sometimes you succeed at not doing that, sometimes you don't. Uh, you're trying not to, to mess your pants. Uh, you normally don't do that, but it's, uh, it's a real uh, physiological overload, and you're, you're mainly trying not to just come unglued at the seams. This is Red Crown on guard. If you allow yourself the luxury of fear, if you allow those motions to take over and control you, you're vulnerable at the same time. The first MiG, I was pretty much in control. The second MiG, when he came in behind me, I saw tracers coming by, and I remember I almost froze. I went, like, what am I gonna do? And, and I remember the fear that started to take over, and I remember the thought process because of the training is, okay, settle down. This guy is not gonna knock it off. He's not gonna quit. This is not a training mission. I've gotta get out of this, and I'm the only one that can do it. And then I was able to take over with my skill because of training and win that fight. Okay, nice show, guys. Get the hell out of here. We're running out of ammo. Okay. Good luck, you got a little behind you. Where is he? Okay, he's right in your tree. I was just going to let him get done. It's a 17, and now he's running. Hey, have a look. As we started to pick the nose back up, we saw a little speck on the, on the nose. It turned out to be an enemy airplane. We tried to pass him close aboard. He started shooting his gun at us. Uh, we made a hard cut to the right to avoid the bullets. He went by us. We pulled up into the vertical, expecting to see that he would be running away. Um, we were very surprised to see he was actually up in the vertical, higher than we were. It is later revealed that their third foe that day is an infamous North Vietnamese ace reputed to have sent 13 Americans down in flames. The engagement becomes legendary and an integral part of Top Gun curriculum. So we ended up uh... No need, I'll probably overstress my wrists here as I get older. I can't do it like I used to be able to, but we ended up in what's called a slow speed, ro slow speed rolling scissor with him behind us the whole time in a position to shoot us. And if this table is the ground, we didn't want to hit the ground, so we have to pull up. We did the best we could trying to keep ourselves out of the flat of his bullets. And he was smart because he would give us a squirt with his bullets right at the bottom, and at the top we were very slow. Whichever way we could roll, we, we tried to be as unpredictable as we could be. But all through this, we were in huge trouble. Randy came back on the power, popped the speed brake. We had no other idea what to do. And as we did, he gently slid out in front. Okay, keep working. I got you, baby. I got you. All right, you know, one down. You got another one. This is the answer. You're clean. You don't have anybody on you. Thank you. Thank you. Three sidewinders fired, three kills, each at very close range. Top Gun graduates Randy Cunningham and Willie Driscoll become America's first aces of the Vietnam War. Despite technological advances, little has changed since the Vietnam era. Modern pilots employ tactics identical to those Cunningham and Driscoll used to knock enemy MiGs out of the sky over 30 years ago. Burners on. A typical mistake made by the students at Miramar is to rely too heavily on high-tech systems instead of the basic piloting skills that got them there. Flying. One of the things that we identify as a weakness in students coming through, and I know it was for me, was making the transition from looking at the radar display to simply looking out the window. Sometimes it can be a hindrance if you don't use it well. I mean, you can get wrapped up in these uh, whiz-bang displays that you have and the electronic and the avionics package in the airplane and maybe lose sight of, hey, I need to maneuver here. I need to move my airplane. I need to look outside. Hey, there's the threat right there.
With technology today, the idea behind it is to make the fighter pilot's job easier. In fact, however, like many of us today in the workplace, the job of the fax machine was to make it easier and the job of the computer was to make it easier, but people want it now. And I think most people in the corporate world today, when they go to work, it's a, it's a whirlwind day. What that translates to from the fighter pilot's perspective, for example, the F-14 might have somewhere in the range of 250 or so different switch positions, nine computers, maybe 80 different displays. And the idea today is within the context of all those displays and all those switch positions, what's most important and what am I going to do? And you're dealing with this, this intense, intense strain and you're already in what's called a combat fog or you're not firing on all cylinders anyway uh, because of the strain of the moment. But through that, somehow, you've got to get through and you have to know that fast what you're going to do. That is um, task overload. Bingo. Bingo. Got four open minutes. Do you want to send a cancel also? One system at the fingertips of today's fighter pilot is the BVR, or Beyond Visual Range Missile. Like most technology, BVR weapons have made lightning advances in recent years. Missiles, like the Navy's AIM-120 AMRAAM and AIM-54 Phoenix, mark a trend of the future in which pilots will routinely kill enemy aircraft from distances of more than 60 miles. With the advent of these missiles, many again believe that dogfighting is a thing of the past. The realities of combat, however, suggest that this may not be the case. Meanwhile, there'll be some top gun instructors who are already up at Channel Lake that'll come out. The men here at Miramar are quick to point out that this same kind of thinking led to the creation of the Navy Fighter Weapons School in the first place. Better training wins wars, not technology. And even though we have supposedly great technology and it will do the job, the Top Gun guy says, well, just in case we really can't use it or it all breaks down, I'm well trained enough to get in there and knife fight with the guy. Well, have some fun. As one guy said, uh, having this great technology and trying to use it is kind of like uh, fighting a knife fight in a phone booth with a spear. And the other guy's got a knife. I want the knife. Uh, the spear's nice, but give me the knife. The classic problem with the beyond visual range fight is you don't know who that is. You'd like to know, and you have a little box inside your airplane that supposedly gives a return to the guy in the other seat that you're a friendly, the box can break. The signatures are much the same. Well, they're gonna look at turbine revolutions. The Russian engine runs different than, a, than an American engine. We're gonna be fighting our own equipment in some of these theaters. Some of our potential enemies are flying our airplanes. Okay, it's an American airplane, now what do we do? The beyond visual range fight has never ever been able to solve this problem. It is still a problem, so you're gonna have to go look at him. Well, once you get close enough to look at him, what have you got? A dog fight. Challenges like these make the Top Gun mission more important than ever before. But Miramar's days may be numbered. Budget cuts and the re-emergence of BVR have put the fighter weapons school under fire. Once again, we are facing the word that the dogfight's probably over. And sure enough, the Air Force has taken all of its aggressor squadrons and gotten rid of them. They don't exist inside the Air Force. And the Navy is condensing their program. I'll call it downsizing. Actually, I'll call it they're eliminating some of the program. So this very successful program that's been so pivotal is now going to slowly disappear again. Unless guys, like they did in the 50s, go out and break the rules. Meet you at 20,000 feet. Click, phone hangs up. Bingo. Bingo.